Talk about railroads for a minute. Um, the only time anybody in this room, except me, thinks about railroads is when. You're in a hurry, and they stop you at a crossing. <laughs> yeah, sons of bitches. Look at this. <laughs> Damn railroad people. Or, or, when the media, we either hit somebody, turn something over, here they come. And I have learned in dealing with the media. In my position, somebody's always watching. It don't matter what you think, somebody's always watching. Like, I can't be moping around. Because you think that banks and everybody else, when they see boat right moping, well, they don't think maybe I'm just having an off day or maybe I don't feel good. Hell, they think something's wrong with one of the companies. And then what happens? Hey, hey, is, is everything all right? They call him. I appreciate you giving the right answer, too, buddy. I have watched the railroads go in the last 20 years, 25 years, from 300,000 employees in North America to 150. Uh, and railroads have record earnings because of it. They learned how to do more with less. More with less. Everybody, anybody in here heard about McCall, Alabama and the Norfolk Southerns putting an intermodal terminal? Anybody? Yep. Intermodal, you're going to start hearing that word a lot more, especially since Warren Buffett bought um, the Burlington Northern Santa Fe. Uh, Matt Rose, the chairman, is a great friend of mine. And uh, intermodal, intermodal. Intermodal is whenever you hear it in the media or the news, all it means is one thing. Trucks, trains, and ships merging together to get a product off the water, off the rail, or off the highway to destination, cheap, cheap, cheap. The reason why railroads will never go away, the reason why I got in the railroad business, imagine this, one rail car can ship four tractor trailer loads. When you see a train that's got 150 cars on it, imagine this, it's burning the same one gallon of diesel fuel that the truck that's all in one container is moving. So who do you think can, could crush if they, had the, if they had a bigger infrastructure? The trains, can truck, the trains can crush the trucks on freight rates. It's just that simple. There was a smart old guy that's no longer with us named J.B. Hunt in 1984. He was like, I tell you what, if I can't beat them, by God, I'll join them. He was the mastermind behind the intermodal. It was not the railroads. He said, man, we could do a piggyback thing. And you see sometimes you may pass see cars coming by with trailers stacked. That's just piggyback. Those things go to an intermodal terminal, they take them off, J.B. Hunt's truck or whoever now hooks up to them, takes them to destination. That's what this intermodal is, it's going out in McCall. And it's going to have a great rippling effect right down to food service. I mean, that food service businesses will start up out there because it's going to bring in thousands of jobs. You've got to support that thing that's being built. It's about like a town. It's also good for the boat ride companies. Why? We make cross ties. They'll need about $55 million worth of creosote treated wood to build that railroad yard. Well, good for boat ride. Is that about right? Is that right? Last thing on railroads. They're not going away. Everywhere I go, everybody wants to ask one thing. Hey, boat right. What about that high speed rail, man? High speed rail. Well, I was in this same room and saw my friend Wick Mormon with the Norfolk Southern chairman. I saw him give his opinion of high speed rail. Well, here's mine. It's going to be a while. You ever had the luxury of leaving this country and going into the European countries like Germany, China, where there is high speed rail? I mean, big time high speed rail. Let's see. Their government picks up all the liability insurance. I don't even know who would underwrite it here. Any insurance people here? What do you think, honey? You know, when a, when a bullet train when a, when a bullet train's going, you know, 160, and you got thousand, two thousand people on it. When it derails, what you figure is going to happen? People are going to die. <laughs> yeah. I don't mean to be funny. Just, you, want, you want to write that one? Yeah. Nobody else will either right now. How would a public or private company make any money? Insurance eat a hole in you. Secondly, they outsmarted us in these European countries a long time ago. Because when they set up their rail system, they took a straight line, and they missed every damn crossing they could where cars intersect. Like if you, if you get on a, a European train, Orient Express, etc., 
You hardly go over any crossings. You're just out in the middle of nowhere. Those guys were brilliant. Those engineers were brilliant. Because high-speed rail was just a drop in the bucket to them because they weren't going to hit anybody. Had to make sure the train didn't come off the track, but they weren't going to be killing people along the way. Going 180 miles an hour takes about five miles to stop. Well, here in America, capitalism, man. Every pig trail we can go through, farm field crossing, whatever, don't matter, man. Just get this infrastructure track built. They built some great railroads in this country, the Norfolk Southern, the CSX, the Union Pacific, the Burlington Northern Santa Fe. God, there's so many crossings, you know. We got a railroad vegetation control business. All it is is keeping the weeds, the tracks free of weeds. It's an FRA rule, and we do it. Uh, it's, it, it it's a great business because you ain't going to fight Mother Nature. That stuff's going to grow every year. Uh, but... Man, we sure know about the crossings. In 600 miles, in a 600-mile span of railroads, you got about 2,000 crossings on average. Nope, we're not quite ready for high-speed rail. Uh, insurance, that's my opinion. Now, when you bring in a lot of people that have been hired to say something different, that normally don't know their ass from a hole in the ground, engineering, saw all these people hired up for whatever, they're not going to say that thing at all well, you know. Smartest guys in the room. Got it all figured out. This has been great. See a lot of future. A lot of young folks. Yep. I've been right where you are. Uh, I hope I was worthy of your time. It was a privilege to be here and speak in front of you. Thank you. We've got we've got some times for some a uh, little bit of time left for Q and A, and so whether it's the rail industry or uh, I think Mr. Boatwright would be willing to answer just about anything you have, and if not, I'll probably tell you he, why he won't answer it. But uh, feel free. Uh, let's let's we have a good time to have some good Q and A. Blair, you want to start us off? I think you got to be a follower before you become a leader, and uh, we have a lot of, in, rail, in the railroad business, we have a lot of what's called sandhouse sessions. Every company, uh, didn't you just get back from the Michigan operation, we have sandhouse sessions. We bring everybody in, you know. Uh, sometimes, uh, if I know somebody's wife's a good cook, I'm like, hey, man, I'll tell your wife to come cook something for everybody. Let's, you know, uh, kind of maybe a little, well, we break bread, we talk. But once again, you heard me earlier, that's your horses. You get to thinking you're going to climb that great big hill of hope alone. Now, nah. sandhouse sessions, at least, they used to keep up with it by the hour, but just start getting so many employees. Now we do it at least twice uh, a quarter. And I sit down and they have the floor because you've got to listen to your people. I'm not, I'm not a historian, but, you know, if you study war history, you learn that, you know, some of the, the warring factions we were against, World War I, World War II, their commanders and their generals, they quit listening to their people. You know, I won't name names, but some of them sent, them sent their people out in the freezing cold. They didn't have the right clothes. They didn't have the right anything. They killed their own people. You know, man, I never give a damn much about learning about history anyway. Hell, I want to make it. <laughs> Next question. Yeah. Sure. Um, you know the uh, Alabama tax-free holiday we do, parents buying kids, their uh, uh, school supplies go back to school, et cetera. Um, my uh, illustrious chief financial officer, hey, quit trying to dodge me, man. I ain't through with you yet. <laughs> he brought it to my attention. He said, hey, he said, why can't we just have our own tax holiday? I said, well, we got any money? He was like, yeah. I said, well, what do we got to do? He said, uh, we can give people a whole day's pay across the board, all of our employees in Alabama, on this tax-free holiday because well over half the, of my employees in Alabama, they got kids that go to school. Uh, 
once we kind of figured it out because you got to, you know, a lot of accounting there, you know, well, yeah, you, you pay all the taxes, boat right, yeah, it's good to go. So what we did is basically they got an essential extra day's pay with no taxes taken out. I mean, you know, of course, with pay scales being different and what have you, uh, what do the average person get an extra $150, $200 or more? Yeah. So for parents, you know, that's uh, $250 to buy blue jeans, notebooks. Hell, I told them on Fox, that stuff ain't free. Well, they beat me up pretty bad. Had a Harvard market expert on there with me. <laughs> I was also on the Alexa Jones show. Uh, it's better known as the Wake Up Alabama show. Uh, great. Best interview was with her. Uh, pardon? Yeah, we don't leave him out. Did that answer your question? And it was great. It builds morale. Built a lot of morale. Uh, of course, all the other states we operate in, they were a little pissed, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Hadn't got around to them yet. Next question. Liz? You're sitting next to him. He taught me everything I ever knew. I didn't know how to read a balance sheet when I came out of the University of Alabama. All I knew how to do when I was down there was I learned how to Learn how to meet deadlines. I uh, have given other answers before, but he, uh, <laughs> yeah. That's one thing, man, If you when, you when you move on up the line, there's one thing about it. I got, you better remember what you say, because, you know, I'm reporters and what have you. It ain't the questions they ask me. It's the things like, <sighs> Mr. Boatwright, uh, in November of 2009, uh, in an article, you said that, when the reporter asks you, Bo Ryan, how did you know when you were starting to become successful? Your answer was, when you can spell subpoena without even thinking about it. <laughs> now, that wasn't a reporter that asked me about that. That was a lawyer sitting across from me, and he said, do you think that's funny? And I was like, obviously you don't, and that's not good for me. <laughs> <laughs> that's the hot seat, man. Because one thing about it, too, it just comes with business now. Get you some good lawyers. You gotta have them. How many lawyers in the room? That a girl, Holly. Yeah, bang that drum, <laughs> baby. Uh, yeah, good lawyers, good accountants. Uh, but the man sitting right there, he uh, he knew I wasn't real smart, but he also knew I wasn't afraid of the damn devil. And I pulled the trigger, and I knew he lost sleep at night when he was just my accountant, because I would shove it all in the middle every time. He'd be like, "Hey, you're not doing bad, man. You got three companies. Why don't we do this? Uh, uh all or none. Bet it off." That is what separates them. And thank God he was able to add a couple extra zeros and we were trying to get the bank to give us a little more money. Hey, thanks, buddy. I'll take care of you, I'll take care of you one day too, man. <laughs> Holly. Oh, God. This won't be good. 